South Africa's maritime transformation began in 1999 when the first group of future leaders underwent training in Rotterdam. This is the story of their ascendance in the maritime sector and their ongoing pursuit of equality in a previously white male dominated industry. These men and women who come from the most humble backgrounds are now at the helm guiding TNPA through the 21st century under the leadership of Captain Rufus Lekala. When I was driving taxis, I used to have a dream of mine because I didn't want to go back where I come from. As a driver, you have to learn to control all characters. Your duty is to take them from point A to point B safely. They don't know your background because they associate taxi driving with inferiority. They don't know that you are there for the sake of feeding your family. I was the first in the family to finish a metric. First in the family to end up in a university. But also, that motivated me. It made me a very strong character. I got nominated as one of the person that were going to be in the pilot training. Then we went to Rotterdam in September of 1999. I became a pilot in Saldana. I worked as a pilot for a period of six to seven months. Then I got re relocated out of Saldana. 2002, the harbour master of the Port of East London decided he wants to go take early retirement. And the leadership said, look, since you are there, why don't we appoint you as a harbour master? I said, but look, I don't think I'm ready for being a harbour master. He said, but there's no absolute science. Human beings are not, we cannot put them in the test tube and test them whether they, they are ready for this and that. Just get, take the job. While I was still entrenching myself in, in East London, I got a call. Guy, the harbour master of the port of Cape Town is retiring. Like, oh, you are moving to come and be harbour master of the port of Cape Town. I said, but look guys, my career started in Cape Town in 1999, but now I'm going back as a leader of the port. They said, don't worry, pack and go. It was not easy when you get to Cape Town, especially when you find that you are going to be a leader of people that used to be your superiors. In 2007, I was on leave. I remember my daughter has just been born. She was about 14 days old. I was on leave and the CEO calls me to say, hey, chief, I want to see you. Then he comes, he sits in the office. When he sits in that office, he says to me, chief, you know that we are doing restructuring in the organization. You are ready now to become the harbour master of the port of Devon. Okay. Devon is the biggest port. I said, yeah, but look, you've been East London for three years. You are now in Cape Town for three years. You've got six years experience as a harbour master. And we feel now is opportunity because the harbour master of the port of Devon is retiring. My goal when I took over as a chief of the master, I said, look, it's for me to start a radical transformation of the harbour masters. Another member of the class of 99 is Alex Mia, whose journey began as a shorthand in Richards Bay. My background is actually from the rural area at a small town on the northern Natal called Eshawe. And accidentally, when I left school finishing my trick, I found myself working in the railway and harbors uh, department uh, in 1985, where we were shorthands actually helping in the mooring of the vessels calling the Port of Riches Bay. And then from there on, I got attracted to becoming a marina seeing these vessels coming in and out of the Port of Riches Bay, bringing in cargo. The moment where I felt, yes, I made it, is when actually one of the old guys who used to be a driver transporting the mooring show hands to and from ships. And then I used to say to them, one day I will drive these big ships. And they used to laugh at me saying, uh, what does he think he is? 
then I used to insist that I will be a port captain in this port. I was saying when I was still in the Richards Bay during the years of 1985, 86, 87. And then one day when I've achieved my pilot license, this same old man had already become a pilot car driver. And then he was taking me from the ship now back to port control. And then he reminded me this when I had already forgotten actually, and then say, hey, Pilot Mayor, do you remember when you arrived here and you're still young telling us that one day you'll drive these ships? And then we used to laugh at you, but look at you now, you are there. And then I actually laughed and was so excited that he remembered those things I said when I was young, just saying for the sake of saying, not even knowing where to study for this career, where to start and who can help me about it. The class of 99 had to prove their value over and over again. Their shared journey is one of camaraderie, companionship and overcoming resistance to a new generation of maritime leaders of colour. I guess these things are put out in the stars really, you know. My father was a skipper of a fishing trawler in the port and as a youngster I would go out fishing with him and he was a captain of his little fishing boat and in and out of the port of PE. By the time I matriculated and finished school, my dad had passed on long, long ago already. And um, I think my mom was driven for me to follow in his footsteps kind of thing. I was a lifeguard all my years. I joined um, the Naval Cadets. I got in every, involved in everything maritime related. I didn't have a clue around the actual mainstream maritime career of tugs, commercial ships, container ships and all these things. What I did know of course is what I was exposed to as a youngster. It was tough times, it was, it's not knowing what we were achieving at the time is the entire transformation of an industry. We basically grew up together, then we used to travel with bus this way, that way. It was trying to make ends meet, trying to travel to and from tech through, you know, all these good things. But I think that is what shaped me as a person. We made it through Technicon. We then went to sea as cadets. 22 years later, this is where I find myself as Arbor Master in the port of PE. Their journey has paved the way for others and most especially opened the doors for women to play a vital role in this industry. I don't think I realized at the time how big it actually was. Being a tug master, you understand what a pilot does, but I don't think we actually understood and personally understood what bigger challenge it was going to be and what impact we needed to have made. But more importantly, it was somebody's dream to have convinced the leadership at the time that this is what we need to do for the country. Along, along those ways, we also, we not only developed ourselves, but we also developed the others as well too, that were after us, that came in after us as well. And the transformation was, uh, I, I would say, in a way radical as well too, because there was a bit of resistance, but we, we ensured, we persevered and made sure that as much as we were successful, we did not let anything deter us in our path of getting to our goals, yeah. When we first started off, we only had one female in 1999, that was Teresa Williams, I remember. But now, if you look at it from the time that the, the course has, uh, the program has started, there's been many females included in there. Now, when you look back, you see the management, you see in key position, you see pilotage, you see tag masters are ladies, you see everything. It's we are actually the biggest employer of ladies in maritime in this country and in the world we are the biggest employer of females in the Port Authority. Now we have three ladies as our harbour master and the deputies we manage to have 60% of the deputies are all female. And that and it's, it's an achievement that I've thought one but we, we planted it from 2012 until now. It, it was not easy because I said to myself, I was given an opportunity. It's upon myself to make sure that I give others opportunity, but not only give opportunity, also support. Being a female pioneer is a difficult path in a male-dominated industry that calls on mental, physical and spiritual strength. What it felt like being the only woman, um, 
Up until that point, it started becoming the norm for me because uh, just the year before, I qualified as a ship navigation officer. So on every course I was on, I was the only female. On every ship I was on for my cadetship, I was the only female. Sometimes there was a second female, but I was always usually the only one. Um, so it started feeling normal. History needs me, my country needs me to become a marine pilot and a female. And all my experience leading up to that prepared me for it. Being the only, being the first in many aspects before then, and I just dug deep. Um, I have an exceptionally strong faith. It was difficult. Um, sometimes I'll be alone as a, as a trainee, as a cadet, and you know how men will treat you when you're the only female. Um, and you, it's like you're invading their space. Um, they were not ready for you. Um, it was difficult. It was really challenging. I became the f uh, one of the three first female pilots to obtain the open license. That means you can do any kind and in, in, in any and type of a ship. But we were the first females, um, so that was history in the making. So that was the best moment. It it has drastically changed because there, there are more more of us now. So um, in a day, the, you you get female on, in, in the entire shift. So it's like it's a norm, it's normal. When you're working at sea, there's a lot of physical work that you need to do. So you have to prove yourself that you're able to do um, the physical work as well as the mental um, work when it comes to navigation. You probably will have a few men that still would kick against it, but ah, we can do it. So <laughs> that's their problem. I have seen the transformation Today we have ladies in every single position and for me it is not only about the numbers. I think we are also becoming more bolder and talking and it's really giving hope to every single person. I think we all have a role to play and we can just work together and create a beautiful maritime industry that our kids are going to be proud of. TNPA success in the maritime space has prompted the organization to apply the same principles in the creation of their own aviation service. Aviation from 1995, probably when I joined the organization, it was run by a private company. And when I moved into in 2007, I met with the then MD of the company, two of them, and I asked them, guys, you've been supplying this service to Transnet for so long. Show me how many African Indian people are in your organization. They could not produce any. And we went deep into financial analysis to say how much money we're spending on them as an organization and they are not transforming. First, we had to hire an expert in aviation. Then we sat together with Agripa, we do the position paper, which is a strategy of how we're going to migrate from an outsource function into an in-source function. Then we gave ourselves five years. TNPA's aviation service has opened up opportunities for talented youngsters from previously disadvantaged backgrounds who had never dreamed of flying a helicopter to join TNPA's ranks as professional pilots and aircraft engineers. In my personal view, I think that has been a huge milestone for TNPA. It has been a game changer because most of those youngsters come from a disadvantages background. Some of them never dreamt of of flying a helicopter before or in their lives. So it's changed not only the TNPA uh, work environment uh, and functionalities, but it changed a few lives of those youngsters uh, looking at where they come from and uh, the different mix and the diversity of our teams. Some of the class of 99 moved through the ranks of operations into important support roles, drawing on their experiences of life at sea to shape our maritime approach. Dennis Mkati is one such example, using his experience to change the way we think about safety. 
based on experience of the Navy, the exposure that I totally had throughout the maritime space. Let me go and ask myself a question and say, how dynamically can I contribute to your organization differently? And that's when I moved to this executive manager for CQ and regulatory oversight for TNPI. Obvious, it's a bit difficult because now you used to be in a water and you're working alone as an individual, now you are sitting in a boardroom. So that skill background of being safety minded all the time and being compliant and ensuring that you need to always tick boxes correctly, it has actually contributed to the skill that I have, this function that I'm heading now. We look back with pride on our success stories and recognize the important role that education and mentorship have played in the development of our leaders. I was telling a few colleagues in the classroom there because some of them are sitting there, I'm a student. And I, I'm just telling them that at one stage you were my student there and I'm so proud to see you as an Abba Master now because it, it, I feel, you know, it, it touches my heart, you know. It's nice for me being one of the older Abba Masters in the system, sitting around the table, sitting young faces, females, that I know I've trained and to see where they are now. The changes in the maritime industry has created so many opportunities for young people because somebody like me from Limpopo who has never been to sea before or even seen an ocean now has an opportunity to work in a port. Uh, I believe, you know, that we, as a country and as a company we've got such a huge potential to change the lives of, of the people. You know, I come from a very, very poor background and one of the biggest thing is, is to basically, I feel I'm on this earth for a reason to make a mark and change other people's lives. TNPA's current crop of leaders are proud mentors and have had a positive impact on their own communities as ambassadors for an inclusive South African future. I've always said, as soon as I got into management and the port of Mossel Bay was my first port, the one thing I try and leave when I leave that port is to have changed and developed one person. That is my only goal, one person. And if I can change one person's life, hopefully that will become a multiplying effect. It is very fulfilling uh, to hear somebody telling you that, uh, you know, uh, you my inspiration, you are my role model. I, I got a lot of those and um, I remember at one stage I went to the garage and I saw this young man. He says, uh, you know, I know you f as long as uh, this time. He mentioned the year, I think 2002 and three. He says, you know, uh, the reason for, for me to push myself is you. You are inspiration. It was, it was a fulfilling uh, uh, thing to hear. The class of 99 had to overcome adversity on their journey to a transformed industry and their experience will help us navigate tricky waters to a new era informed by big data and technology. Maritime education has evolved and it continues to evolve. Appreciate that maritime is much more than seafaring. Being in education and in my position that I'm in now, I see that specifically daily, that we need broader research, we need broader innovation, and through the training programs on offer now, that is what we hope to achieve. To instill in the learner an understanding that there is climate change, there is water scarcity, there is solar energy, and that is all linked to maritime, and how through researching those various aspects of maritime, there is an actual career path that can be forged much broader, not exclusively to seafaring. As we look to the future, we acknowledge the trailblazers who have lit the path for future pioneers. This is where I need to be, this is where I want to be, this is where I'm going to be. Becoming a pilot resonates with one of my favorite quotes by Ralph Waldo Emerson. Says, do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. And that is how significant becoming a pilot has been for me. I've left a trail.